journey yet. You can't take me where you've never been. You have to have gone into the presence of God to move us into a place of deliverance. Is anybody grateful that you have an opportunity to serve him? I don't know. Is anybody happy that the Lord picked us up, turned us around, planted our feet on solid ground? Pray for me. I really mean pray for me. And if you pray for me, we'll get out of here before midnight. Turn your Bibles with me. Turn your Bibles with me. To the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews 4 verse 14 and then Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10. And I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. As you're turning your Bibles, dear, as we have been discussing over the last several Days, I want to remind us that Hebrews is what we have learned and what we will continue to learn quite a bit about the life of Jesus Christ and as Reverend Holgate shared on Wednesday night and about his superiority and uh, chapter one and for example as we move on we heard of Jesus superiority as it is compared to angels and and in chapter 3, we heard of his superiority uh, as it relates to Moses. And I think if you want to find a good summary for the whole book of Hebrews, it's basically Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And that captures the very essence of the book of Hebrews. And with that in mind, I want you to know that tonight... Um, passage or our author unpacks for us what perhaps is the most prominent or the most important aspects of Jesus' superiority in the book of Hebrews. That is, he is a high priest. But he is not just a high priest, he is the great high priest. And much has been written, as you have heard, and you will continue to hear about the priesthood of Christ in this book. And I pray that tonight that this very critical doctrine finds space to live in our lives, in our hearts, as we share in the word of God tonight. You might have to rebuke the devil of sleep. Because usually the devil provokes us to doze off when it's hard to digest the word. But in the name of Jesus, we shall get through. I'm going to read the 14th verse. Since we have a great high who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable 
to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we might receive, your Bible might say fine, but receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Chapter 5, verse 1, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on the behalf of men in relation to God. They're to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset or clothed with weaknesses. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice. He is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself and just called himself a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. He was holy. And although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who would obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. If this is going to make any sense to us tonight, it's important that we lay down a consensus or have a consensus of a understanding of what faith really is in the book of Hebrews. Faith is one of those words that is commonly used but not always understood. Some of that confusion I sense comes from the many different ways faith is used in our everyday conversation. And if you were to go and look at the dictionary.com, shows seven different types of usages for the word faith. One common way that people use the word faith is to refer to belief in something despite lacking any evidence for it, end quote. But is that what the Bible really means when it talks about faith? The answer is no. The closest that the Bible comes to offering us an exact definition of Hebrews 11.1 1 is, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And from this passage, we see that the central feature of faith is not trusting that you will get a car or a house. But the central belief of faith is having confidence and trust in Almighty God. And in the Bible, the object of faith is God and what he has promised. Now, 
there becomes a problem when we don't know the promises of God. Because then we start looking to God for things he never promised us. And we are praying for things that are disconnected from the purpose and the will of God in our lives. And if we were to share the mic tonight about the promises of God, hopefully all of us will be able to have a same testimony about what indeed it is we are looking to God for. So the church is now at a place of ignorance and people are falling away from the body of Christ because they are disappointed when they come to the Lord Jesus Christ after we have called them to the altar, prayed for them, baptized them, and we have sold them a lie and we have forgot to tell them of the true promises of God. So when God does not heal from cancer, we don't have a word to say. When things do not work the way we want them to, people stop coming to church. They forsake the assembling of the saints because they are now discouraged and they don't have any real grounding about what God is calling us to do and what God is saying. So this convention is interesting and it's very, very peculiar because we've heard some profound messages over the last several days and, and last night. And I honor God for how he's releasing in this house. I want you to note that what this theme is about is about you and I taking an inventory about what kind of faith we have. Here is the thing, believers, when, when Jesus was talking to Peter, who said, I love you, Peter. I love you, Jesus, I love you, I love you. Jesus recognized that what he was saying was genuine. His heart really meant it, but his flesh was going to be challenged. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, I, listen to me, I get it, but I want you to know that the devil desires to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you. Not that you won't have a problem. I didn't pray that you won't have trials. I didn't pray that you won't have a circumstance that seems insurmountable. But I prayed that your faith fail it not. It is not devils that run us out of church. It's not even people in the church that run us out of church. What we wrestle with is our ability to hold on to faith when we are faced with trouble. And, and, and Reverend Taylor, what we have to do now is take a grip of what faith really is. We probably have to go back and remind folks that an example of faith is Abraham's encounter with God in the book of Genesis 15 in response to God's promises of countless descendants. Abraham believed the Lord. Say, believe the Lord. Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. And please note, it was Paul that takes this up and he, 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 he writes in, in the book of uh, uh, of, of Romans and he says listen I want you to know something about Abraham no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God but he grew strong in his faith now, we don't grow strong with things we grow strong in the faith and, and, and if city mission my church, if we're going to survive this season, we're going to have to know what it is we believe and what we are standing for. What is the profession of our faith? What well, we are challenged in America, and I'm going to behave myself because I know we're streaming, but there are some subtle, if not 
flagrant attacks on the body of Christ. But what the devil is trying to do is infiltrate the church. You ain't going to say nothing and that's all right. But we have men who think they are women and women who think they are men. And, and we have bishops who are homosexuals and we have choir directors who are misconstrued. And if we're not careful, we're not better than any other church. But we have to have say faith, faith, faith. And hold fast to the profession of our faith. And that means one generation to another generation has to declare it's holiness or nothing at all. We don't want people saved because they got excited at the altar because that's not going to help you when a trial comes. We don't want people just speaking in tongues and then when the devil and demons meet you on the outside, you can't hold on. We need praise and worship leaders who have tried God and who have come through some fire so when there are troubles in the house, they still take up the mic and still say praise the Lord. You ain't going to say nothing. We need choir members who are sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says rooted and grounded. So when the winds of tribulation blow, they can still say, I call him Jesus. We need ushers standing at the door with a discerning spirit. So when the enemy attacks, they can still blow the trumpet in Zion. We need grounded people. Some folks can preach prophetic and prolific messages, but when storms blow, they don't want to hold the mic anymore. They're requesting a different mission field, another assignment, because it's too difficult. But I have come to tell somebody, it's not by might, nor by power, but somebody has to have a spirit for your faith becomes perfect. <laughs> Count it joy when your faith has been tried because it builds stamina, it builds endurance, it builds tenacity, it builds resilience. Lord, the whole bus. The headache just left me. We need people that will stand in a gap when people talk about you. Stand up and preach when they turn their backs on you. Stand up and declare the said God when nobody is behind you because it is not by might. It's not by power but it is by my spirit. So, faith, faith is more than an intellectual agreement. Faith is more than just saying, I agree with what God says. I was to use an illustration here. Imagine you're at the Niagara Falls watching a tightrope walker. And this individual walks this tightrope and he does it very well. Then he says, here is a barrel. Come inside the barrel and let me walk you across the Niagara Falls on this tightrope. Now you have seen him do it and you're convinced that he can do it. But it doesn't become faith until you get into the barrel and let him take you across. So sometimes we know God can do it. 
we have an intellectual agreement that God can move this mountain. But when the mountain appears, we are challenged, my sister, to praise God and to worship through that situation in that season. Faith has to be better than that. Faith has to be stronger than that. And we have to spend less time playing church and start grounding the believers in the faith. And what we don't know, we don't teach because we're not comfortable with it. But Jesus said that your faith is what's going to keep you in the season of adversity. Some things you won't be healed from. Some things you won't get delivered out of. Paul says, I went to God and I prayed three times and I said, God, move this thorn. And God said, no, I'm not moving it. But my grace is sufficient. Ooh, I say, God, help me here. There are some things you're fasting about. I've come to tell you, stop fasting about it. There's some things you're praying about. Stop praying about it. And change your position. And start praising God for your trial. Who am I talking to? Start praising him for your setback. Start praising him for your opposition. Because when you learn about God, he teaches that your faith, your faith will not fail you. Because my, my strength is made perfect in our weakness. So faith is more than an intellectual agreement, but faith is having confidence in God that he's able to get us to the promise that he has made. The Christian journey is really about the believer inheriting the promises of God. So, the church here in Hebrews were wrestling with their faith. Good church was struggling with faith. Had potential, but struggling with faith. Had good goals and priorities and, 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 and aspirations, but they struggle with their faith. Because they staggered at the promises of Almighty God. They wavered. So, genuine biblical faith expresses itself in everyday life. James writes in James 2.17, Faith by itself, apart from work, is dead. Faith works through love to produce tangible evidence of its existence in a person's life, according to Galatians 5, 6. And if I was to put this in another way, the obedience that pleases God comes from the difference in the world between one who buys me a gift because they want to give me a gift and one who gives me a gift because they felt obligated to do so. Don't get me something because you feel obligated to. Give me something because it comes from your heart. So in essence, Jesus is saying, don't serve me if you don't want to. Because serving me is not a burden. Serving me is not hardship. Not in this church, but in some places I hear people talk about God as if he's, yes. he's a problem. Oh, God. 
but I'm still here. He says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. And bless. what a shift in this convention. If everybody is just grateful that they have an opportunity to serve God. I don't know. What a powerful manifestation of healing and deliverance if we just had 10 people that's grateful for serving God. They don't want no praise. They don't want any accolades. They're just glad to be among them. You will make the moderator's job easy if you leave your car praising God. That's why I don't want musicians that aren't anointed. Because you ain't ready yet. You can't take me where you've never been. You have to have gone into the presence of God to move us into a place of deliverance. Is anybody grateful that you have an opportunity to serve him? I don't know. Is anybody happy that the Lord picked us up, turned us around, planted our feet on solid ground? Man, just throw up your hands and say, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. With all of the crosses, I'm grateful. With all of the challenges, I'm grateful. Because Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross. I have stopped complaining. When God gives me bad people, that's all right. Because God sent them for a purpose. You ain't gonna say, praise the Lord. I have stopped whining and complaining like Christian babies that we complain as leaders about everything that comes our way. But we have to stand in the gap because the working, the working, the trying of your faith, work it, it's building you up. And when you pass one test, God gives you another one. So you can say, I've been there, done that. I'm better for it. Anybody want to praise him for a trial? That's too radical. Anybody want to praise him for a problem? That's too radical. Anybody want to praise him for heartache? Anybody want to praise him for depression? Anybody want to praise him for sin? Yes. Moses. Moses became frustrated and God said Moses speak to the rock and Moses struck the rock because the people had worn him down so his faith wavered in a moment that God wanted to elevate him and some of us are missing breakthrough. Because when it's time to hold on, you let go. Growing up in a church is different from just coming into a church. When you grow up in a church, you see people. You see the evolution, you see changes. People come, people go. And you learn how to be grounded. Some people have to go. They're gone because they're not of us. That's what the scripture says. And you can't be crying over people who've gone. And if God has removed people out of your life, stop saying, God, bring them back. Stop praying that nonsense. And say, God, I get you. This is your church. I was getting dressed tonight and the Lord said to me, he is the constructor of the church. He is the architectural designer of the church. And I said, God, you have a sense of humor because you were a carpenter before a hammer was invented. You ain't going to talk to me. He was able to construct things before we invented things. But he was the great master builder. And he said, upon this rock, Peter, he had enough sense to know I can't build a church on sand. But a builder said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Anybody want to praise God for a 
a builder. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. Oh, the church is not going to die. The church is not, doors won't close. The church will not lose out. Before the church fail, you die. For the church triumphant. So, it is a privilege to serve in God's church. It's an honor to serve in God's church. Lord Jesus. Give me 15 more minutes. It's a privilege to serve God. So now we have to become more selective who we put a choir gown on. You gotta be careful who you anoint. Start asking people, do you love God more than these? And if they're unwilling to make, listen, you, we have to make big decisions. I don't care how good you can speak in tongues. I don't care how good you can preach. That's not going to help you. Because you, the devil is not a little boy in shorts with a pitchfork. There is a battle in the mind of the believers every day. And, 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 I, know, and I, I know people are talking about this and that. And I, I'm not interested in church political challenges. Because that comes with the job. That's all right. We have to deal with circumcision. You have to deal with incest. You have to deal with Barnabas. You, you will have challenges in the church. But you have to have enough faith in God to know who the master builder is. I wish somebody would praise God. I don't know, but help me out. Is Kellidge Ridge still open? Is it still open? It was here before you. Is Cheesefield still open? It was here before you. Is Linstead still open? It was here before you. Get it in your spirit. All you have to do is leave it better than you find it. None of this belongs to us. This is the Lord's church. Woo. I have come to the knowledge that all I am is a servant of God. These churches were built because God built the church. And nobody lords over his church. The Bible says, and the high priest is over the house of God. Please note two things. A prophet and a priest has two different functions. The priest's purpose was to draw us close to God. The prophet brings God close to us. So a priest moved the people in the opposite direction of the prophet. So for example, when the priest drew near to God in the most holy place of the tabernacle of the temple, that's the place where God's glory dwelt. On earth, in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the people that the priests represented drew near to God through the priests by the way of the priests. So in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, a priest was really important because it was through a priest that you were able to commune with God. Yet by and large, I think it is probably lost in the church today because most of us do not really understand the role of the priest and why it would have been necessary in the first place. Remember this church, that our neighbors and friends, including maybe some of us from time to time, must remember 
that sin cost. Sin is costly. And because God has an incommutable attribute of holiness, he cannot entangle himself with sin. So from where God is and from where we are is a mighty gulf. It took a sacrifice to close the gulf. Even right now, if, Jesus, if God does not see the blood of his son, he can't even look on us. If we're not covered by the blood, God will have to. You remember Jesus had the sins of the world on him. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For a brief moment, he could not look at his son because of the sins of the world, because of his holy characteristic. But I thank God that when he sees me, he doesn't see my righteousness. When he looks at you, he sees what Jesus has done. That's why we're covered under the blood. And some people praise God as if they're entitled to this. And I have a right to this. Which one of us is worthy of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you have enough sense, you'll praise God for his death, burial, resurrection, and the son. Look at your neighbor now. I feel preaching my belly. And say, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. Oh, say, I'm grateful, say, I'm grateful. If you don't mean it, don't say it. But if you mean you're grateful, say, I'm grateful. I said, say, I'm grateful. Stop singing these new songs that elevate you above. The... Get back to at the cross. At the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. Come on, somebody. It was there by faith. I received my sight. Get back to the Ira Sankey. Oh, the love that drew me. Oh, the blood that brought me. Oh, the grace that brought me to the fall. Wondrous grace. Now, we have songs that says, I'm bad. I'm a conqueror. Yes, you are. Through Jesus Christ. You are victorious through Jesus Christ. So, it costs something. It costs something. So, when we understand the cost, Bishop, our attitude changes. So our big idea tonight, if you were to take three points away from the passages that I shared, is one, that the high priest is explained, and two, the high priesthood is explained. The high priest and the high, and Christ's high priesthood is explained, and then Christ's high priesthood is applied. If you want to, you can consider this a three-point sermon or a two-point sermon with some application in the third point. But that's up to you how you break it down. So we talked a little bit about in our introduction. Yes, that was just the introduction of the high priest and what the high priest did. Who was the high priest? And we read about it. Notice that in our passage, our author is concerned not so much with the high priest or the priesthood in general or but he's more concerned about who was this high priest 
and what was the responsibilities of the high priest. In our passage, we're given very little information. So you got to look to chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 of Hebrews that talks about how does one become a high priest. And just for your purpose, I'm going to read it again. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset with weaknesses. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he would those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself but only when called by God just as Aaron was. I don't want you in this convention to demonize the priests. Don't demonize the priests. Because the priest or the high priest was appointed by God. They needed to be called by God. And their purpose was to appeal for the people. They were the ones that were charged to bring the people close to God. Did you get that? But before they were able to be appointed as a priest or a high priest, the people had to approve them because he would be the one to advocate for the people. And the people wanted somebody that can sympathize with their challenges, with their weaknesses, and with their shortcomings. So, so the priest now had been, you had to be called to advocate for the people. If you don't love God's people, you're disqualified. Not in this church tonight, but there are some people that don't love God's people. They love the office. but they don't love God's people. But a prerequisite for a priest was that you had to love God's people because if you missed a step into the, the tabernacle, it could cost you your life. I don't know why people run after position and title. The first prerequisite of a minister is that you must love God's people. love God's people different shapes different sizes different personality and people know when you don't like them how can we preach to people we don't love how can we call to worship to people we don't care for people come on take off the uniform take a seat and be comfortable but you must love God's people and you must get up in the morning and say thank God for the people you gave Jesus did love Judas and Judas betrayed him Ministry is built on love. A genuine love for the people of God. You love them when they're up. And you love them more when they're down. There are some people we don't call anymore. <laughs> because they disappointed us. We don't love them no more because they talked about us. I can't be bothered with those people. 
if I retaliated against everybody that talked about me. What a lonely place this would be. Because you hear things. Everybody's not a cheerleader. Everybody's not going to give you a round of applause. And if you're looking for it, shame on you. We are in ministry because we are the royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. Look at your neighbor and say, you are a priest. Like it or not, you have been called into this priesthood. If you are saved, you have been called into the priesthood. You are part of this. And that means you must provoke one another to love. You must love one another. We have to love each other. Love is not saying I love you, I love you. That's foolishness. But love me when I'm good. Lift me up when I'm done. I'm talking to a young person here tonight. Love it gets you love, 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 love. I show you a more excellent gift. It's better than prophecy. We don't need a conference for prophets. We don't need a conference for evangelism. We need a love convert. Hold on, don't tickle. Hold on, Rory. Please don't tickle me yet. I'm coming. We need a conference where everybody comes together and say, I'm just here to pray for your weakness. So the prerequisite here of the priest was because I am weak, Bishop. I'm going to put on my colorful garments. And I'm going to hide my weakness. But I'm willing to risk my life and to get into the holies of holies. But before I get you there, I'm going to fix me. Because if I get into that place, and there's not cleanliness on me, it will cost me my life. <laughs> See, the truth of the matter is, some of us don't want to give our lives for the people. That's why I don't want you to demonize the priest. Because it was no honor. When this, this book was written, it was in the first century. And let me tell you what they were doing. They were putting people in the priesthood for political reasons. Because the priesthood had some political influence. So people will find who they like and say, you become a high priest. Or find somebody with the right last name. But the scripture said, the only people that can qualify to be a high priest must be appointed by God. And they recognize their shortcoming. I'm almost finished. Woo. Hallelujah. So we thank God who we have now a high priest who has passed through the heavens. So look with me and see for every high priest is appointed by God. Let me try to unpack that. We learn in the text, verses 1 to 4, that what the high priest was responsible for doing. Two, we learn how the high priest was supposed to do what he did and that he is a high priest was supposed to act with sympathy. Feel what your people feel. Understand what they're going through. Be empathetic. Offices in church, all of them is a function of an office, not just a title. So the elder served. The prophet served. The evangelist served. The bishops served. The highest seat in the church is the greatest servant. Yeah. 
We don't need anybody to carry our Bibles. Where did this arrogance come from? That people have to carry our this and wipe our that. That was not the intent of ministry. Jesus said, I must wash your feet. I'm not institutionalizing a new doctrine in the church. I just want you to know it was about Jesus showing humility. And he was the highest seat. He was the son of almighty God. But he said, I am here to serve. So if you don't like God's people, you're disqualified. If you won't give your life for God's people, you're disqualified. And if you won't serve God's people, disqualified oh Jesus it seems to me that this text is shaking up the leadership of the church and repositioning a mindset that has crept into the body of Christ. Where we are no longer looking at the people, but we're looking at ourselves. I, I, the personal pronoun is going to high, manifest itself before the fall. I am in charge. This is my church. You hear what's happening? Listen to the conversations. We are quickly removing ourselves from the spirit of humility to the spirit of arrogance. Because power is a dangerous thing in the wrong hands. And Jesus says, I need you to do two things to watch the application. One, draw near to God. Did you see that in the text? Draw near to God. Boldness means confidence. So it don't mean, God, I'm here. It means God, I believe you called me here. So, and, and God is saying, I want you not just to stop at the first lava, but come closer. Now, listen to this. The only people that went to see God were those who needed to be cleansed. If you are not in need of something, Bishop, you have no business going into the Holy of Holies. If everything is all right, sit this convention out. This call is for those who have a need. Mm -hmm. The only reason to enter into where God has invited you is because you have a need. Weakness. Call it what you want. And when you get there, watch what Jesus says, you will find Grace and help. In your time of need, I've come to convention 
not to be consecrated. I have come to convention because I have a need. And I've decided to step out of the crowd. Because I have an invitation from the one who knows my weakness. I have an invitation from the one that knows my shortcomings. And he says, come Stephen, come close. I promise I won't reject you. Come close. But Lord, the sin is too great, come close. And the closer I get, the more grace I receive. Now you know what grace is. Grace is that thing we don't deserve. Because God knows if it was somebody else, they would have killed us a long time. God, don't you see how dirty I am? He says, come closer. And then when you come close, I want you to do one more thing. Hold fast to the profession of your faith. What do you mean, God? I mean, I told you I'll make a way. Hold on to it. I told you I'll keep you. Hold on to it. And watch, and watch God's personality because we're in the 10th chapter. And it's one book just reading with a comma. And verse 11, chapter 11 says, Now, now faith. Don't preach that to people and tell them, use this to get healed. Not, not in this convention. Use this to take a tighter grip. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And the conviction of things I don't see. That means when it looks like I won't make it in, I'll still praise God because I have confidence Woo. that the Lord is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. Again, stop trying to get in on your own merit. Your work is rubbish. You can give 70 years of ministry. The only thing God wants is a grounded faith. That says, God, I know you can. Who am I talking to? Lord, I know you will. I just wish you would look at three people and tell them, hold on. Hold on to what? Tell them, hold on to what? Hold on to what? The promise. Come on, talk to me. Hold on to what? I feel like you're getting this. Out. Hold on to what? The promise. Say, hold on to the promise. Tell them, don't hold on to your money. Don't hold on to people. Don't hold on to things. I got something better than things. I got something better than money. I have Jesus Christ. I said, hold on to the promise that when the trump of God shall sound, do we still believe in the resurrection? So why have we stopped preaching it? The trump of God shall sound first and the dead in Christ shall And those who are alive and remain shall be caught up and meet the Lord in the air. And so forever we will be with the Lord. Shout, that's a promise. And while we are here, we have eternal life. You shall lay hands on the sick and they can recover 
and they will recover. In 1933, the late Mary Core, Bishop Evangelist at the time, says, what do ye think of Christ? Some speak of him as though he was the great I was. But we know him in this church to be the great I am. Some read James 5, 15. And the prayer of faith may save the sick. And the Lord may raise him up. And if he, if he have committed sins, they may be forgotten. Even then, they should come to the healing meeting. Tell them not to come because they don't believe that divine healing is still in existence. I hear the late Bishop Kaur saying, we don't serve the great I was. We serve the great I am. There is a promise in this church that God will heal his people. It's all right, you don't talk about water and blood, that's fine. Bring me that chauffeur. I travel all the way here, please. Thank you, Bishop. This instrument is a symbol of what Israel used when it was time to go to war. They recognized that sometimes the nation will come under attack. But there are people in the camp that will hold on to the faith. All of us won't back. All of us won't retreat. All of us aren't going to give up. There are some people you're sitting right next to right now are thinking about leaving right now. Don't, don't, don't be fooled. Just look down your row. Some people think they're bigger than city mission. Their ministry is bigger than this. But there are yet some still in the camp that comes what may, we must hold the line. I wish I had one of you here. Yes. Bishop Gale, when in Joshua 6.20, they heard the sound of the trumpet, my brother. The people shouted. It was an indication to heaven we're not going anywhere. I hope I still have some preachers that are still committed to the faith. Come on, nudge your neighbor, say, stay committed. Come on, look at each choir member, say, hang on in there. Say, hold fast, hold fast. After convention, still wear your robe. I don't know her. After this is over, still find your place.
people know no retreat. No surrender. My brother, the Bible says, provoke one another unto love. You must have discerning eyes. And when you see someone weak in the spirit, pull them up. And say, we're going to make it together. Touch your neighbor. Wake up, wake up, wake up. leaders they started the song service and they're still standing today I wonder if I have somebody that's determined to hold the fire hold the fire hold fast hold fast come on look and say hold fast hold fast We will keep blowing the trumpet in Zion. I 
feel like I'm in church. I feel like there is an army in the house. Like a mighty army. Move the church of God. Brothers, we are treading. We are not divided. Is there one more war cry in the house? The devil can't win tonight. When they heard the trumpet, the Bible says the walls came coming. Come, 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 come. I met Bishop Gale. She came to Miami. City Mission. She was worker, Marcia Gale. And the theme was the second touch. As she preached, it was like 40 years ago. <laughs> Bishop Maxwell is the first person, second. First, to allow me to preach in his church outside of Miami. There was no title. There was no Bible school at the time. He said, preach. And they're still standing today. Listen to me. You ready? You ready? I think I have one more blow. I think this wall is coming down tonight. Bishop, the wall that tries to block city mission advancement, the wall that's trying to stop our progress. Look at your neighbor, say it's coming down, it's coming. I said, look at somebody, say it's coming, coming down. It's coming down. Shout, it's coming down. Coming down in Rosedale. <laughs> Coming down in Jersey, coming down in Babaku Sunday, coming down in Russell Penn, coming down in California, coming down in Brooklyn.
not surrender. The church triumphant. people tell them we win we win we win come on tell them hold on we win I said let them know they win let them know they win tell me we are not defeated you're not defeated you're not defeated you're not defeated you're not defeated curses the wall that's tying up your children the wall that's defeating your family the church is still alive when they heard the trumpet with a great shout and the wall came hold fast God will stick to his promises The altar is open. I'm counting to three. I'm calling for somebody that needs help. That's who comes into the holiest. You will not be disappointed. 
you will not be disappointed because your great high priest took the flagging two thumbs with lead at the end whipped his back and for every whip ripped his flesh and when he went to Caiaphas and refused the answer the soldiers slapped him spat upon him and if that was not enough they put on his bruise ripped flesh back a robe found a thorn branch twisted it pressed it into his skull took a stick hit him in his head thrusting the crown of thorns deeper into his head. Then they, after they had enough fun, the sores that were closing or clasping to the wounds, they ripped off the garment, reopening the wounds. on him the top of the cross the authors the artists or artists didn't depict it correctly all he had was the cross bar and they placed it on his back some say it's about 110 pounds for every convicted man that was going to be executed or crucified had to carry the crossbar to their place. So now on his open wounds his body fatigued and tired he carried the cross. He fell down man from Cyrene helped pick up the cross and carried it some more of the distance because the soldiers wanted to get it over with. When they got to Mount Calvary they threw him down. Some people have a, a nail in the palm of his hand, that's not accurate. But a thorn of, uh, in the palm of the hand, it will rip. The weight of the body will tear the fingers. But the soldier quickly drove the nail in between his bones. They didn't know they were understanding a prophetic word that said not one of his bones will be broken. They nailed his wrist to the cross. The next hand. Put his left foot under his right. Extended his toes. And nailed his feet. Lift him up. his body hung suspended he uttered his seven cries I am the great high priest father forgive them they know not what they do custom will have it that Jesus who now can't breathe took a breath looked at two 
soldiers are still thieves. I said to one, today you will be with me in paradise. Took another breath. Your 